Last night, Ava made a bunch of pasta, a bunch of risotto, and a bunch of polenta. But did we eat any of it? No. Ava made uh, these three Italian staple carbs so that today we could show you dishes that are made specifically with leftovers. I say leftovers in air quotes because uh, I don't know about your household, but at least in our household, there is very rarely leftover pasta or risotto or polenta. But the reality, Arthur, is that uh, those three dishes that we are going to cook, they are so good that even if you don't have leftovers, make the leftovers in order to have the day after those dishes. Because believe us, they are too good. <laughs> The first two of these are two of my favorites. The third one you've told me about, but I've never actually had, so I'm excited to try it. But we're gonna start with one that we made a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, but it's been so long, it's really worth revisiting. Here we have a bowl of white leftover spaghetti. In this moment, believe me, they are screaming. <laughs> but just in this moment, because from here in 10 minutes, they will go back to life. I treat these spaghetti in the most simple way, which means I just cook them and then pour some olive oil. When they were cold, I put in the fridge. Keep in mind that you can do this recipe also if you have uh, any other kind of leftover pasta, which means you have uh, pasta with tomato sauce uh, leftover, you can use that. And uh, like a matriciana, every kind of pasta you have. I'm going to use uh, for my pasta, and here I have about 200 grams of pasta, I'm going to use five eggs. They, they should be enough. So adjust the egg on the quantity of pasta that you have. The other ingredients that I'm going to use is cheese. And I always suggest to use cheese for a dish like that for two main reasons. Number one, the cheese will work as a glue when it will melt. So it will keep your frittata more uh, together. And the second reason is that uh, with cheese, everything tastes better. I'm going to use uh, pecorino, but feel free to use mozzarella. You can chop the mozzarella, fresh pecorino chopped. You can use cheddar, you can use uh, parmigiano, you can use, uh, I don't know, every cheese you like and every cheese that you have in the fridge. And here we have uh, another ingredients. Now, you can use salami, ham, maybe prosciutto crudo, not really because it, it becomes uh, too salty. You can use, uh, I don't know, also um, turkey, turkey slice though. Today I'm going to use uh, duya because finally I have it, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> The first step for this recipe is to choose your pan because depending on the quantity of your leftover pasta you can use a big pan like mine or if you have just a little bit you can use also a small one. Everything depends on the quantity. In a non-stick pan you need to heat a little bit of olive oil. And you need to pour your leftover pasta that right now is the nightmare of every Italian <laughs> here. What we want is to re reheat a little bit the pasta and give to the pasta a little bit of crunchy consistency. Meanwhile, we are going to work with the, on our eggs. Looking at the quantity of my pasta and at the size of my pan. And looking at the quantity of eggs, actually I think that I need at least one more egg. Salt. Pepper. And cheese. How much cheese, Ava? How much do you like? How much do you have in the fridge? Because I'm going to use uh, duya, I will uh, pour the duya in the pasta right now. If you're going to use, I don't know, ham or something like that, uh, chop your ham and put in the eggs. And now I leave uh, 
the nduya melts and believe me right now maybe i will go and eat the pasta like this actually this is kind of like pasta l'assassina but with nduya which come to think of it this <laughs> sort of a match made in heaven. The assassins from Bari are gonna come to get me for saying that. When your pasta will be a little bit drier, because as you can see, it's drier and looks drier than before when we just take out from the fridge. We understand that is the moment to pour our egg inside. But before, we need to flat the pasta. Before I pour the eggs, I just lower the heat at minimum. And then, gentle, I pour the eggs. I like to cover it, and now I will let it cook like that for six, seven minutes, and then I will check on it. As you can see, in the middle is still raw. Let the center thicken a little bit. I keep covering it, and just, how do you say? Raise? Yes, the heat a little bit. So now, because the inside doesn't really jiggle, jiggle it's the moment in which we can flip the frittata. Slice the frittata on a lid. Is this? We cover it, low heat again, and we let it cook until it's done. To be sure that your frittata is cooked both sides, what you can do is, with a spatula, just flip a little bit the edges and check if it has that brown color that is the symptom that your frittata is cooked. The symptom? Symptom, it's like, <laughs> I don't know, do you say the sign? I diagnose you with pasta frittata. Yeah, I can say that my frittata is ready. It smells wonderful. <laughs> now, the frittata di pasta can be enjoyed in two ways. One, actually in three ways. One, warm. Right now it's too hot, so I'll let it cool down for about five minutes. Number two, completely cold. Because this is actually is a, a street food. It's a food perfect for a picnic. Third way, Two slices of bread, a slice of frittata, and enjoy. Now I have had many frittate di pasta before, but never one with induya, and I'm pretty sure, not 100% sure, but pretty sure that it's going to prove to be an excellent idea. Also because duya can just improve something, but it can't destroy something. This dish in general though, it's like, oh, it's so, it's so special to me. If you didn't grow up in an Italian household, like I did not, uh, you might not be aware that uh, Italian moms use their, their oven as like a second refrigerator and they just keep like, you know, food in there, food that doesn't need to be refrigerated. And so this is exactly the kind of thing that like you walk down into Mama Rosa's kitchen and you're like, I wonder what there is. And you open the, the oven and there's a big frittata di pasta there. And it's like the perfect sort of like midnight snack sort of thing. Not just midnight, you can snack on it in the morning, in the afternoon, at midnight. Anytime. And the other place where actually you see this dish always and all over is Naples. Because this yeah. dish is from Naples and you're walking in the street of Naples see in this uh, glass window, uh, the big uh, frittata big, di pasta, thick, thick one. like that, yeah. uh, when you are traveling and you want to bring something with you. Oh yeah, this is the kind of thing you would sort of wrap up and take with you as yeah, a- It's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> snack on the road. Yep. It's a good looking frittata di pasta right there. What a potato. Always good, but with enduya. Mmm, mmm. It's one of those things that until you don't eat, 
you don't know what you are missing. And it's really convenient because you can do with every kind of pasta, but give another life to your pasta. Without putting it in the microwave, give another life and just enjoy. This is hard because I could totally eat that whole thing. But ironically, on this video about leftovers, I have to let that be leftovers because we have more leftovers to get to. Here we have some leftover risotto allo zafferano. For, for those who have no idea what Ava's saying, uh, saffron risotto. Sì, risotto allo zafferano. What I did with my leftover risotto was place the risotto from a pan or a pot in a dish, spread it, but if your risotto is good, it will spread naturally, and let it completely cool down. When it was cold, I covered in plastic paper and I put in the fridge. Traditionally, this dish, this recipe is made with leftover risotto allo zafferano, risotto giallo, but actually you can uh, do this with more most of the risotti. Now, this is the easiest dish of today because what we need is a leftover risotto and just a little bit of butter. Nothing more, nothing less. We are going to place some butter inside our pan. Here works the same idea of the frittata. So choose the pan according to the quantity of risotto you have. On a medium low heat, we melt the butter with a spatula. We need to transfer the risotto in the pan. And always with the spatula, we actually need to press the risotto. Now what we need to do is let it become crunchy. We don't need to cover it. Well, with the frittata, we cover the frittata. In this case, we don't need to cover. So, in about eight, nine minutes, we can check if the bottom layer of our risotto actually is crunchy. And then is the moment in which we can flip it. That smells better than when you just cooked the risotto last night. Actually, you know what? Right now, in the restaurant in Milan, there are several restaurants in Milan where they on purpose make the risotto and put in the fridge in order to present on the menu this dish. It's very hard, actually, to use a spatula to check on the bottom if it's cooked because it's very, very delicate. The sign that is ready are, number one, all the edges that uh, as you can see, they are uh, brown. And then the fact that uh, you can move it without really break it. So those are the two signs that is the moment in which you can flip it. The risotto is a little bit more delicate than a frittata, which means that we need to grease with a little bit of butter a lid that we are going to use to flip it. <laughs> you understand that it's ready when you can turn it, move it without any breakage. Breakage. So this means that your rice is ready. Now you can eat it hot, like in three minutes. You can eat it warm, but actually you can eat it also cold. This leftover dish is a somewhat recent uh, discovery of mine, or not discovery, <laughs> I didn't discover it. <laughs> you introduced me to it. It's a new experience. Yeah, yeah. This is what they call in Milano or in Italy in general, risotto al salto. And salto actually means jump, because when you cook this kind of dish, the rice jump is not. Oh, because it has to be able to like slide off the pan. Yeah. And uh, it was born as a way to not waste the leftover risotto. But as I said before, a lot of restaurants actually in Milan, they are presenting into the menu because it's amazing. Yeah, this is like definitely worth just 
Making. Making risotto in order to make this. It smells so good. It smells like concentrated risotto. Risotto already smells so good, but then when you like refry it. By the way, buon appetito. Buon appetito. I know how it tastes good. But every time that I eat it, it surprises I'm, you. I'm impressed though yeah. on how good it is. That's truly like. I'm <laughs> that's truly the best risotto that you can have. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I mean, it's like it really is kind of. This is a case where the leftovers are better than the dish you started with. It's very important that the risotto you are using is a good risotto because then, as you saw, it's just a matter of just refried it. If you don't have like the butter and the cheese to glue it all together. It'll just be this crumbly, dry mess. It won't stick together at all. Yet another reason, do not skimp when making risotto. It needs to be cheesy and creamy and delicious and starchy. And it, it needs to be a risotto. <laughs> yeah. There will be no leftovers of these leftovers in your house, that's for sure. That is the bomb. <laughs> that is so good. Right now we have to move on to our third leftover, an important but oft forgotten carb in Italian cuisine, and that of course is polenta. Polenta time. See Arpir, it's polenta time, and this time with the polenta we are going to make a dessert, because after a risotto, after uh, pasta, we need a dessert. Yeah, these look like dessert ingredients. What do we got? Milk, apple, lemon, raisins, butter, eggs, sugar, baking powder, and cinnamon. This is after what I, cho I chose though, to make my dessert. What is mandatory for this recipe is the milk, eggs, sugar, obvious, the butter, and a little bit of baking powder. All the rest you can uh, adjust as you like. If it happens that you don't have an apple, you can skip. If you prefer instead of a lemon, uh, the orange zest, uh, you can put the orange zest. You don't like raisin, uh, skip the raisin. What I did with my leftover polenta was just uh, spread the polenta hot in this uh, baking tray. After it was completely cold, I covered it with plastic paper and I put it in the fridge. The first step is uh, melting the butter. I'm going with 80 grams of butter. You need also to pay attention on the quantity of polenta that you have, because if you have a kilo of leftover polenta, maybe yes, you need a little bit more butter. Now you can melt on a stove, or if you have a microwave, when something tells me that every one of you has a microwave, put in the microwave 30 seconds and the work is done. I'm going also to soak the raisin for about 10 minutes in warm water. Then, if you prefer a little bit of alcoholic taste, soak your raisin in grappa, rum, whiskey, limoncello, whatever you have at home. And to make our polenta cake, we need a food processor, a blender, food processor, a blender, whatever you have at home. Now that the polenta is cold, what we are going to do is blend the polenta. I'm going to use two eggs because they seem right for the quantity of polenta that I have. And the quantity of polenta that I have is 200, I made the polenta with 250 grams of flour. If you are going to use 500 grams of flour, maybe use four eggs instead of two. You need to adjust based on the quantity that you have. Now we put inside the sugar. I'm going with 150 grams of sugar. Same as before. Adjust the sugar based on your taste and on the quantity of polenta that you have. All the method butter. Here I have a cup of milk. I'm not going to use this uh, in one time because uh, I need to check on the consistency. More than a pinch of cinnamon. <laughs> Base it always on your taste. I'm going to use uh, like this quantity of uh, 
baking powder. We don't really need the, to make it rice. This can help maybe to give a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say fluffy consistency because it will be not fluffy, but uh, it helps a little bit. I check on the consistency because uh, I need to decide if I need more milk or not. As you can see, it's a very thick consistency. So what here we want to recreate is like a normal cake butter consistency. So because it's too thick, I'm going to add a little bit more milk. Okay, this is what I wanted. This is the moment in which we can add the, the nuts, the fruit that we chose to use. So in my case, because I'm going to use raisin, I will squeeze out the water and place the raisin here. I'm just chopped the apple without not a lot of care. It's like because I don't like to have a big, big chunk, I chopped. If you like, uh, I don't know, to slice, uh, slice your apple. You know, Harper, what uh, works very good here? What? A carrot. Oh. Which means that now I go and check if I have a carrot in the fridge. Find one? See, I'm pretty lucky because I have uh, some carrots that actually they were screaming at my fridge. So, Alper, do you want it, uh, your cake uh, thicker or thinner? Oh, there's a choice. If you want your cake thinner, we will use the bigger one. If you want your cake thicker, we will use the smaller one. So I take it it doesn't really matter too much the size of your cake? Not really. It depends how you want. Well, you know how I like things thick, so let's do that one. You can dust your... Uh... Pan. Your pen with a little bit of breadcrumb, a little bit of uh, flour, but because uh, I made a polenta cake, I'm going to use a little bit of cornmeal. I'm going to bake it at 390 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 190 degrees Celsius. I think that for mine, it will take about 50 minutes, one hour. The only thing that you can do is uh, do the classical, how do you say, proof? Classical test with a knife or a stuzzicadente. Toothpick? Yes. You put inside, if when you take out, it will be dry, it will be clean, your cake is ready. This one is totally new to me. This is a traditional cake or use of the leftover polenta that comes from obviously the north of Italy. Now there are two versions of this cake. This cake is called the torta putana. Now for my, no, putana with one T, not two T. Doesn't mean that. No, doesn't mean that. What I was going to say is that there are two versions. One that is made with leftover bread. Mm, okay. And the other one that is made with leftover polenta. Being a way to use the leftovers, there isn't really a quantity, a measurement, no. a 
traditional recipe and blah blah blah. Just adjust on what you have and on what you like. I love the addition of carrots. It's like Italian carrot cake. This is one quality that I love about. There, there are a lot of Italian cakes that sort of do this. I'm sure probably in other cultures where a lot of the dough and batter relies heavily on something like fruit, like apples or something, and they stay very, very, I'm sorry, I know a lot of people don't like this word, but moist. Or moisty, as I like to say. Moisty. <laughs> I don't know if moisty is better. It's a traditional English-British word. Yes, we did learn that. Ava's supposedly made-up word actually is a word. No, I didn't make up, made up. It's because I studied... But you made it up and then someone informed you that it happens to I be a real word. I studied English-British -Bri English at the school, so it was one... <laughs> By the way, buon appetito. Buon appetito. Oh, oh, come on now. The things that you don't expect to be amazing, they actually are more than amazing. It does not taste like something that you sort of make like, well, I have these leftovers, I guess I'll make that. <laughs> this is, I guess I shouldn't be surprised at this point, but this is one that is totally worth going out of your way to make. It's really delicious. Delicate, it's full of flavor. It's also there sweet, but not too much sweet. Also, the carrots, really good. No, the carrots are a, a perfect addition. Definitely make some polenta to make this. And I have a suggestion here, a very creative suggestion. It's a cake made out of leftover. But then, if it happens that you have the leftover, the leftover of the leftover. Do you have an idea? Yes. Slice it mm -hmm. and make a sort of French toast on how they call in France uh, pain perdue. You dip in egg with some cinnamon, you fry it, and then you tell me. <laughs> we need to do a sequel to this video. How to use the leftovers from oh, the last definitely. video we made. So you need to make, before the original We dish. can go in an infinite loop. Maybe we can make it 365 days of just... <laughs> On that note, we better get going because I have some leftover cake and some leftover frittata di pasta and some leftover risotto al salto that need to be dealt with. But before we go... A quick shout out to a pasta grammarian in action. Elizabeth made... I think probably uh, one of your biggest recent obsessions. The, those are gnocchi di susine or plums gnocchi, prunes gnocchi. That, believe me, is one of the most amazing. Surprisingly amazing. Surprisingly amazing. Pasta dessert. Dessert, dessert pasta. pasta yeah. That you can have. They're amazing. They shocked me when you made those for me. I had no idea how good they were going to be. Anyway, those look delicious, Elizabeth. Well done. If you want to become a pasta grammarian, just hit that subscribe button. Follow us on social media at Pasta Grammar. And if you try any of these recipes, if you do something fun and creative with your leftovers, tag us in a picture on Instagram or Facebook. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Ciao. Ciao. I'm coming back to the cake, but I need to, I need some more risotto al salto ASAP. Stat. Mamma mia, the smell of this cake is amazing. <laughs> <laughs>